Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Tissue Chips, Building Confidence Through Independent Experimental Testing, presented by Dr. Yvonne Rusin, Professor, College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, Texas A&M University. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rusin. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Well, hello to you all, and thank you for uh, your interest in Lab Roots and in this particular conference. It is a privilege for me to participate, and I also wanted to thank Lab Roots for organizing these events and for scheduling these educational webinars. So, as was said, uh, my job today is to tell you uh, about our experiences with uh, testing tissue chips. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I'm a toxicologist by training, and uh, I also have an MD. And um, I came to interacting with tissue chips as a biomedical researcher and a mechanistic toxicologist. And before I begin, I wanted to uh, have a disclaimer. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was interviewed by Nature Medicine for a feature article that they were putting together on chip power. And um, a couple of quotes that they used in that particular article uh, reflected uh, how I felt about tissue chips and microphysiological systems two years ago. And in part, my presentation today will be a transition of me personally as a scientist and as a toxicologist and uh, what type of confidence I was able to build into myself and into the stakeholders that we collaborate with. So I said that I don't want to assume that more complicated system is better. And as you can imagine, tissue chips are much for more complicated than traditional in vitro systems. And I also said that I was at that time a healthy skeptic about tissue chips and how much promise they can actually hold. And I did feel that uh, a number of developers have overpromised with respect to what they can deliver. And um, this was something that we've probably all seen before with promising technology not living up to its expectations and perhaps fading much sooner than it can really deliver because the expectations were much greater. So um, what we have tried to do in the last couple of years uh, is to help both the bioengineers and the end users to have greater confidence in tissue chips as a technology that can be used for safety and toxicity testing and also in other parts of drug development. So before I begin giving you the data, I wanted to thank National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences for funding us uh, with a two-year grant uh, in 2016. And this year, uh, or late last year, they actually uh, funded us again for two more years. But uh, all of the data that we have been able to collect as a uh, tissue chip testing center at Texas a &M University was really a product of four uh, very able postdocs and technicians. And then we have a couple of people that are helping out in analytical chemistry, and I'll share some of that data with you as well. And most importantly, we have a number of faculty who we are able to reach out for consultation. There's really myself and Dr. Clifford Stefan at one of our um, partner organizations that have overseen the laboratory experiments. But most important, I'm very grateful to our collaborators from nine universities that have shared their devices with us, that have hosted our staff and their laboratories to learn how to use their technology, and who have stayed interacting with us with respect to protocols and data analysis and interpretation of their results. So I'm really grateful not only to principal investigators, but also to their students, technicians, and postdocs who have really uh, gone out of their way working with us. 
So I wanted to start at the very beginning, and this slide is the, cor uh, is the courtesy of uh, Dr. Danila Tagli from uh, ANCATS. And uh, ANCATS is one of the funding agencies at, um, that is part of National Institutes of Health in the United States that has been funding a lot of biomedical uh, engineering research into developing tissue chips. So what you can see at the bottom of your screen, um, NCATS has um, provided a number of grants, and I will tell you more about them on the next couple of slides, that are aimed to develop microphysiological systems that replicate replicate organ function and structure that can be used to test uh, compounds that can be actually taken outside of the laboratory. And these particular devices are meant to be uh, beyond just the publication and something of an academic interest. They're really meant to be used by the stakeholders, and that's what you see on the very top. The industry and regulatory agencies really are the ones that are uh, prospective users of this technology. And most importantly, um, this particular technology, if people have confidence in it and if it really works, can be something that contract research organizations can provide as a service to multiple clients to build up the data and to increase further confidence in using these types of data for decision making in regulatory environments. However, as frequently happens, there is a large gap between the people who develop technology and people who can be potential users of this particular technology. And that gap in biomedical sciences is very challenging to bridge. And NCATS uh, designed the program to uh, bring tissue chip testing centers who would be trying to be the bridge between the technology developers and the technology users, because there's a lot of um, writing, not only in terms of finances, but also advances of um, drug development and chemical safety evaluation on this. So NCATS issued a program announcement in 2016 and the call for proposals that would last for about two years uh, that would test two to three new devices about every six months and would have a throughput of a couple of compounds and tested for a couple of different phenotypes and replicated a couple of times. So really, uh, two and a half years ago, nobody knew what uh, is the opportunity and whether this tissue chip testing is even possible. So NCATS has uh, called this program announcement uh, Next Gen Tissue Chip Testing Centers Validating Microphysiological System. And validation means different thing in different contexts. What you can see on the left uh, at FDA, analytical and clinical validation is really something that is uh, quite established. <clears throat> I'm using, <coughs> excuse me, an example of uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, but uh, you know they're very similar principles in Europe and in other countries. And validation really is broken into both analytical and clinical validation. And in both of these contexts, one really needs to understand how the device or how the test will be used. And once you understand the context of use for that particular device, you can understand where the bar is for how good that technology should be. And once you understand the use and what the uh, level of evidence one needs, you can actually embark on the process of qualification. And qualification of uh, biomarkers, qualification of survey instruments and other things in um, uh, you know, in, in drug world is not an easy process that takes uh, years and it takes many stakeholders. Now, on the chemical side, there's, uh, you know, validation of alternative methods that many of you may be familiar with. And that's a process that is very rigorously uh, regulated and specified by a number of uh, legal documents and frameworks. In Europe, for example, the uh, cosmetics directive and the REACH regulation describe what uh, validation alternative methods really is. And then the United States, Japan, Korea, Brazil, and other countries, there are very parallel efforts. And internationally, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, has actually a, a guideline that is a guidance document on validation and international acceptance of new or updated test methods for hazard assessment. And the guidelines states that um, there are three components of three major elements in validation. There's a testing of reliability, there's a testing of relevance, and then there has to be a purpose in which this particular test will be used. And so when this comes to tissue chips and the vision that MCATS had two and a half years ago for what tissue chip testing centers should do, it was uh, not entirely clear which ones of these 
qualifications or validations, or is it reliability or is it relevance? And it was left to the um, grantees or people who wanted to uh, solicit for these particular grants uh, to define what that meant. So first thing that we had to start with was to define what tissue chips are out there. And MCAT specified that the tissue chip testing centers were only to work with developers who have been funded by MCATs. And in 2012, there was a first round of grants awarded, and all of this information is available on MCATs website. If you just Google MCATs and tissue chip, you'll be led to a website that has plenty of information on the developers, on what they've done, what they've published, and a lot of information is provided for you. But as you can see, there is a diversity of institutions, there is a diversity of the uh, projects of tissues or models that have been proposed. And we reached out to all of these and then we ended up with about two thirds of the developers who were interested in working with us. And as uh, I will say at the end of this presentation, you know, one of the challenges is to actually convince people who develop technology uh, to let third party test that technology before it actually hits real world. And that's just the reality uh, and I'm not really taking sides in this myself. Now, when we proposed to do tissue chip testing center, and as you can see, we have a tax valve as our uh, title, and we're at the Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas, we really uh, reasoned that this is, um, it takes a village to do this type of work, and you need to have experts from different disciplines. And as you can see, this puzzle board at the bottom left, you need to have expertise in toxicology and analytical chemistry and uh, bioengineering and microfluidics. You need to have folks who understand how to use these data on uh, pharmacokinetic modeling. Uh, there are a lot of measurements that are being taken that are very diverse from protein measurements to gene expression to images. And then you have to do this at um, uh, GLP-like environment, so you have to make sure that your work is actually quality controlled as well. But there are other parameters and uh, core principles that were important to us. First, we really wanted to make sure that our team of scientists is independent of the MCATs uh, funded tissue chip developers. So as you can see on the um, next click, we have a diversity of faculty, and even though some of them are bioengineers, they're not funded currently by MCAT, so we really had no conflict of interest uh, as far as we are concerned. Second important thing that I wanted to highlight is that you really need to compare the data from the 3D microphysiological system to the standard in vitro culture model. It is also important to compare to the in vivo situation whenever possible, but because in principle, these microphysiological systems are uh, using cells, then recreating some form of a much simpler system that probably has a higher throughput and can be attainable by more laboratories uh, was something that was very important to us. And unfortunately, in the uh, bioengineering world, the tissue chip development world, very few labs actually provide comparison to the 2D systems. So we had a complicated org chart, and um, I'm not going to take you uh, through it uh, for a very long time, just to point out that not only it takes a village of a lot of different uh, people with a lot of different expertise to have this type of a throughput to test eight to 12 platforms in two years, you really need to have capacity to do this. And so we were fortunate to have two different sites at Texas A&M University, one in Houston, one in College Station. It was about an hour and a half drive between these two facilities. We had two labs in Houston and four labs in College Station that kind of came together and interacted on a weekly basis and changed, uh, exchanged uh, compounds, exchanged data, exchanged protocol and information. But we also were interacting very closely with our tissue chip developers, as I already mentioned, but also that's not the end of it. Uh, we had monthly teleconferences with our funder and CATS, but also with representatives of various pharmaceutical companies that have since organized into the IQ uh, consortium affiliate on microphysiological systems. And last but not least, all of the data that we're generating, we're uh, depositing into the University of Pittsburgh Microphysiological Systems database. This was one of the grants awarded under this mechanism. And I, uh, again, uh, welcome you to go and explore microphysiological systems database. Again, you can just Google for that and you can easily find it. Now, the as I already mentioned, this uh, type of an effort that I will describe to you in some detail uh, took uh, only about two years. And for those of you in academia, you certainly would appreciate that two years is a very short uh, period of time 
because by the time you actually get funding in and actually start projects, hire staff, and actually uh, you know begin doing things, you already lost valuable time. So we had to devise a standardized workflow that we could follow not only for every chip, but also to organize our work. Now, I already mentioned that we try to test devices in about a six-month period because we reasoned that in the real world, in the, whether it's a pharmaceutical or a chemical company or contract research organization, you know, people who are not developing the particular model will not have uh, long enough staying power. If it really doesn't work in a couple of months, then it's not worth investing more time and you need to move on to something. So we try to use very similar uh thinking process. But you also see that there are different tiers, there are different steps. The first step is really to establish a collaboration, and there is a tremendous amount of legal uh, agreements that have to be negotiated between the universities to change this, uh, change the technology and data and do other things. You have to share protocols. You have to actually go in and send uh, staff to train in the developer labs. And once you're through that, uh, then you actually get the devices and you try to put it all together in your own lab and then without sales, try to see if you can establish flow or if you can do other things. And at that step, we usually started putting chemicals on these devices and examining whether or not we have a lot of binding of chemicals to these devices because they're made of various types of materials. And many of these materials can bind um, you know, compounds, especially based on uh, their physical chemical properties. Then once we are through with that, we can actually try to replicate what the developers have published or were just about to publish. And we would develop in that process very detailed protocols and standard operating procedures. And then if we're through with that, through our conversations with our colleagues in pharmaceutical companies and other toxicologists, we will try to define some form of a context of use for each of these models. And we'll try to conduct additional studies that can gain um, additional attention from the potential end users that can actually answer some of the questions, very practical questions that they have that may or may not have been addressed in the original publication that just described the technology itself. So um, I was very pleased that over these two years, we were able to complete 11 different tissue chip platforms. You can see on the left are the diversity of tissues and models. There's only one that was uh, you know, similar, and I will tell you more about this. We had two models of the liver. All of these, as I already mentioned, were funded by MCATs. Uh, there are a lot of other technology uh, platforms out there. There are other universities, there are other companies that developed that. We had to focus on what was funded by MCATs. Uh, we had collaborated with nine different universities, and we have to complete a variety of uh, legal agreements with them and we've tested seven of these in College Station and four of these in Houston and as you can see by the end of 2018 we've uh, been able to take uh, 10 of the 11 all the way through tier 2 and then one of the platforms we stopped in tier 1 because of the throughput and other challenges that we had. If you look at the timeline, more of a Gantt chart-like view, you see that uh, we started in two sites. The maroon is College Station, the blue is uh, our site in Houston, and uh, we got confidence in uh, working with the developers getting uh, into this workflow. And then our next uh, period was uh, more confidence with a couple of platforms on each site. And then towards the end, we really uh, kind of were confident in our ability to uh, run multiple platforms in parallel. So we were able to work with uh, uh, three to five different platforms at the same time. So let me give you a couple of examples of uh, what the data looks like. And I uh, broken these slides into uh, types of uh, perfusion or um, lack thereof in these particular models. Because for me as a toxicologist, it was very interesting uh, to learn that in the field of biomedical engineering, uh, tissue chip or microphysiological is not really you know, very well-defined terms. And really each laboratory defines uh, what is microphysiological, what is or is not a tissue chip themselves. And as long as they can convince uh, uh, peer reviewers and publish papers and uh, if they can convince funders uh, to get more grants, uh, that's how they perceive what is microphysiological. But obviously, each platform is trying to replicate either a tissue, either uh, organ, or some part thereof. And then uh, it actually is trying to replicate some sort of physiology or, or anatomy on the micro scale. So a good uh, couple of examples were uh, platforms that actually have no flow. They're static uh, cultures, but they are very complicated cultures. One is uh, bone 
uh, with and without tumor model from Columbia University. And what this is, is uh, essentially a, a plate which has uh, chambers and these chambers contain in them uh, pieces of uh, decellularized bovine trabecular bone that have been uh, seeded with human osteoblasts and human sarcoma cells. So it's a human tissue, but there is no flow in that tissue. And what we have done uh, after repeating the experiments that the uh, colleagues at Columbia University did, we actually tried to do uh, or simulate treatment of um, metastasis into the bone. And we tried to look at which drugs uh, are used in the clinic and which regimens are being used. Uh, so we would first culture these uh, platforms after receiving them from Columbia for seven days. And then depending on the particular treatment, whether it's a cisplatin, methotrexate, and Christine dexamethasone, or a combination of drugs, we try to treat for uh, several consecutive days and then have an off period and then treat again, and then evaluate uh, growth of new and sarcoma cells two weeks after the termination of treatment. And so we've done all of this in comparison, as I mentioned, with two-dimensional culture, where just culture viewing sarcoma cells. And what you see here is viability uh, two weeks after termination of treatment. And uh, we normalize everything to the uh, growth rate of the Ewing sarcoma cells without any treatment. That's the controls across the top of this bar graph. And then you can see there is a concentration response. We've tested uh, human CMAX and then uh, kind of you know half an order of magnitude or an order of magnitude above or below. And you can see you can kill Ewing sarcoma cells with cisplatin. You can, uh, there's a clear concentration response with methotrexate in both models. I think Christine is very effective. Now, the interesting difference was with dexamethasone. Dexamethasone really is not supposed to have any effect on Ewing sarcoma cells, but it was toxic to the um, osteoblasts. And so uh, Ewing sarcoma cells were dying as they were losing the support of the osteoblasts. And then the combination treatment was more effective in 3D. So there are important differences between 2D and 3D, but there's, uh, you know, the biggest difference to me is how much variability is there in the 3D platform because it's very difficult to control the number of viewing sarcoma cells that are being seeded into this model. So you have to have an effect that is um, really uh, a pronounced effect and it's very difficult to achieve statistical significance and have a very good titration of concentration responses compared to the 2D system. And you also may have some of these unexpected effects like we've seen with the dexamethasone. Another platform that's uh, really a static culture, but still has a microphysiological uh, nature to it was a uh, intestinal and thyroid model that was developed uh, jointly by uh, scientists at Johns Hopkins University and Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, this is a co-culture of different uh, cells uh, from the gut. And some of them are IPS derived and some of them are primary cells or cell, uh, cell lines. And these are propagated as enteroids. But then once you start testing them, this is really a transwell system where you have a monolayer of this co-culture and then you can add drugs uh, you know, into the trans as well and then measure permeability or you can measure permeability in the reverse order as well. And um, you know I'm not going to show you a lot of data but just as an example, uh, the published data is on the left from Johns Hopkins and Baylor College of Medicine. They were looking at uh, transepithelial uh, electrical resistance, the measure of the barrier function of this particular model. And as you can see, the tier is going up with days of differentiation. That's what you need to see. And on the right is very similar data obtained by our colleagues in Houston. The uh, transepithelial electrical resistance goes up as it should be uh, going. And then the permeability to uh, fit the label dextrin and is, uh, is actually decreasing. So again, the barrier does take a couple of day to, days to establish, but it is a pretty nice barrier that you can test. And again, I will not uh, you know, belabor the point of the amount of data that we've collected with this model system. We've tested two dozen different drugs, and this is a graph of uh, how we selected these dra uh, drugs. There's actually a lot of data on CACO2 model versus uh, human absorption in the gut, and we've tried to test uh, compounds that actually actually have uh, you know, very good concordance with the compounds that actually don't have a very good concordance between CACO2 and human absorption. And all of these data will be uh, you know, uh, submitted for publication in the next couple of months as we're still working through analytical chemistry on these data. Now, the other uh, types of platforms that we've seen were based on perfusion, but it's a perfusion that is driven by gravity. So there are no uh, pumps uh, that are involved in this particular experiment. 
and all you have is, as uh, the example on the left of the uh, heart on the chip or cardiac model uh, from University of California, Berkeley, you can see um, the model is pretty small. Two of these uh, chips can fit on one uh, histological slide. Uh, in the middle on the top, you see the, there's about 50,000 uh, cardiomyocytes that are tightly packed into a chamber. And then the perfusion is actually happening along the side. So there's a passive diffusion of media and drug into the system. And then you can see on the uh, top right that there are um, pipette tips that are filled with media, and then the media just flows from one side to the next, and then it equilibrates, and then you can replace the media uh, next day or in a couple of days. And we unfortunately cannot show you the movies. These are the two slides on the on the bottom in this box, uh, but you can see that uh, you know these are different experiments, and the reproducibility of how many cells we can actually get into this chamber is actually pretty uh, good. And uh, the types of data that we're collecting is actually beating. So there's a video microscopy of these cells uh, beating after a couple of days of culture in this chamber, and it's very well known that you can get cardiomyocytes to beat in culture in the traditional 2D system. And what you see uh, in blue on the middle left is these cardiomyocytes beat in both directions uh, kind of there's a not a directionality of beating but our colleagues from Berkeley have uh, published on this model and they've shown that if you pack them into this particular uh, chamber you force them to beat only in one direction so that you can actually uh, measure contractility um, albeit we didn't do this in our experiments. And at the bottom, you can see that we can establish the same directionality of beating. If you see collar, that means that the cells are pulling in one direction and they're not pulling in the orthogonal direction. And then you can test uh, different drugs and concentration response. You can do um, kind of escalation of the dose in the same device, or you can uh, you know, do other time series or other types of experiments, and you can derive effective concentrations, and you can compare those to the CMAX or, or other types of uh, experiments. And again, you can see that both us and uh, the developers have published uh, the developers have published um, a couple of papers where they've compared their results to those uh, of human CMAX, a couple of uh, known drugs, and these were very similar, which gives confidence in this technology. We have not published our data yet, but we get very similar data, which again, uh, you know, is, is a good result and something that we're very glad to see. Another model that is based on uh, gravity-driven perfusion, albeit not with the uh, pipette tips, but more of the reservoirs, and that particular platform is the vascularized tumor model from your California Irvine Labs. And uh, this particular model, if you see on the right, their first generation was, uh, you know, a glass slide with... Uh, uh, actual chambers that were filled with media. They have since miniaturized this into more of a 96 uh, well uh, plate like. Um, organization. There are actually 12 devices because each has a number of chambers uh, that are actually constituting one device. But, you know, this is higher throughput because you can actually work with uh, 12 devices at the same time. So this is data from a publication from the developers. You can see that uh, endothelial cells that are seeded together with uh, cancer cells form uh, networks and in red are endothelial cells and they're very nice networks. And then in green are fluorescent uh, cancer cells. And in this particular experiment, they had four different uh, cancer cell lines that were seeded into their devices. And then you can add uh, different drugs uh, to this you know, passive perfusion system and you can compare the cytotoxicity of those anti-cancer drugs, uh, both uh, in a 2D system and in a 3D system. So uh, it's uh, you know not, uh, uh, a technology that's uh, you know very easy to establish. However, in our lab, we uh, were able to successfully not only uh, establish these endothelial cell networks. You can see on top is the phase contrast image, and then on the middle in red is endothelial cell network, and then. A at the bottom in green is the same device that has been perfused uh, from one side with dextran. So not only these are cords of endothelial cells, these are actually perfusible channels. And as you can see, fitzidextran entered on one side actually fills in uh, the network of the vessels in this particular device. And again, there's a lot of data that we have generated that I don't have time to go into right now. 
Now, the last couple of devices that I wanted to show you are actually active perfusion or pump-driven uh, systems. And again, there are you know, additional complications with this. So the first example I wanted to give you is the proximal tubule device uh, that was developed at the University of Washington. And uh, this device is based on a commercial chip from a company called Nordis uh, that can be used a couple of different ways. And I'll show you on the next couple of slides uh, an alternative way this chip was used. But in essence, um, this is a part of a nephron. This is not kidney on the chip. This is, you know, doesn't have a um, uh, glomerulus, uh, but you, there are a lot of questions about drugs and chemicals uh, and their effects in the proximal tubules. So it does, uh, you know, represent a very useful microphysiological model. And then once you actually, you know, put this all together, it's a channel that is lined up with uh, renal proximal uh, tubule um, epithelial cells. And this is the channel that is perfused with media. And this is the uh, system that can be either enclosed in these particular um, enclosures that uh, you can acquire from Nordis. Uh, and in the middle here, you can see how this is all uh, looking in the standard tissue culture incubator, you can fit about 24 of these chips. And, uh, uh, you know, one challenge with these models is they are not, you know, a 24 hour or one week experiments. It takes about a week to actually get the channel uh, established and perfusible. And then after that, you can do this experiment for a couple of weeks and cells survive quite nicely. And so we both use the, um, the devices from Nordis and just the regular uh, syringe pumps uh, that are much more economical. Uh, way of uh, doing these experiments, and the results are essentially the same. So it's not how fancy your device is or your setup is, it's how technically skilled you are and also how uh, well you can differentiate between different cell sources. So uh, the results of this particular technology have been uh, technology have been published a couple of months ago, and this is an open access publication. I invite you to uh, go and, uh, and find this and read it in greater detail. But one of the uh, things that we were really Really interested in is whether there is a difference in uh, where you get the RP text. So our collaborators from the University of Washington have shared with us a um, um, couple of vials of uh, more or less primary uh, RP text that they have isolated uh, from uh, uh, donor tissue at the University of Washington. And then we procured cells from Lonzo, which is a commercial supplier, and there are other companies as well. And there was no particular reason we have used cells from Lonzo, so I'm not uh, vouching for that particular source in any way. And here, this is the data on gene expression. As you can see, these particular cells from both sources express kidney-specific uh, biomarkers, both injury biomarkers and kidney metabolism and transport biomarkers. One important thing I wanted to point out is that the basal expression are uh, dramatic for important things like KIM-1. So you can see HAVCR1, which is uh, KIM-1 is expressed at the much uh, higher level in Lanza cells. And um, but then lipocalin uh, LCM2 is actually expressed at low levels, but still you can see that in uh, more primary architects versus ones that you can get from Lonza. But then what we did with these data, we actually compared gene expression profiles to uh, human kidney cortex data from another NIH project called uh, Tissue Gene Expression Consortium, GTEx. And as you can see, kidney cortex is on the top in red, and our two different um, RPTEx in culture, either 2D or 3D, are uh, towards the bottom. So they're not really identical in their gene expression profile to kidney cortex. But what you can see is it's really doesn't matter how you culture these cells, it's the cell source that is actually driving the differences in gene expression. And then the figure on the bottom right shows that with different treatments that we have subjected these cells to and then the gene expression profiling, again, you have grouping or clustering of uh, cells or data by their source rather than by the actual treatment. And that's a very important point to recognize. Now, the actual experiments that we described in this study uh, were, again, comparing and contrasting M31 and Lonza cells, and you can culture these cells for up to 28 days, um, uh, both in 2D and in 3D. You can see the channel 
3D in fluidic, you see these cells are elongated with the flow and they're more haphazard and uh, scattered in a 2D culture. And then, uh, you know, Kim one levels, again, are much, much higher in Lanza cells than in the Kim 31 RPTX. And again, they kind of, you know, uh, steady up uh, as you go on with culture. And this is, you know, a very healthy culture if you're not treating it with anything. And uh, we really aim to uh, replicate what the developers have published. So on the right, you can see key data from WebRL 2016 publication and Kidney International. And what our collaborators did, they not only described the model, they also put this model to the test uh, with respect to its physiology. So in the middle on the right, you see that they have looked at uh, switch in vitamin D metabolism uh, with you know add addition of calcitriol and then also inducibility of cytochrome p 50 24A1 when you actually switch the vitamin D metabolism. And at the bottom, uh, they found that as they lower pH of their perfusion media, they actually see an increase in ammonia generation. So we tried to replicate these key elements of their publication. Plus, we also tested polymix and V effects. And that's those are panels across the top and the middle ones. And you can see that Polymix B was toxic to RPTX in 2D in both uh, Lonza and HIM31 cells, but HIM31 cells were very resilient to Polymix B in 3D system when Lonza cells really died off in the uh, 3D chip. And uh, important point of biomarkers of injury Kim one you can see it go up very early if you can collect enough perfusate uh, in these uh, models. But as you can see uh, with lots of cells at 48 hours, you see Kim one is actually going down and it's not because there's less toxicity, there's actually fewer to no cells uh, to generate Kim one and to shed that into the media. But more important, uh, uh, or interesting findings were with vitamin D metabolism. We found that both HIM1, um, HIM31 cells and Lonza cells induce cytochrome P450 24A1 in 3D culture, not in 2D culture when we added calcitriol, but we did not see the change in metabolite formation with Lonza cells, when, but with HIM31 cells, we saw a very similar effect as in the published uh, publication. But with um, ammoniogenesis, we actually found an opposite result. So as we lowered the pH of the media, we saw a decrease in ammonia generation. So we overall concluded in that paper that the key elements uh, as far as physiology, vitamin D metabolism, inducibility of the uh, uh, metabolic enzymes is Rep, uh, reproducible. However, some of the uh, you know experiments probably do depend very uh, greatly on a particular donor of cells or a particular source source of the cells that you get. But if you can, rem uh, as you probably remember, we also had this you know last tier, which is trying to define the context of use and trying to do more than the developers have done uh, themselves as they were developing the technology. And what we've done, uh, we've tested a variety of um, uh, nephrotoxic drugs, cisplatin, gentamicin, and cadmium, and we have uh, shown that there was a time-dependent and concentration-dependent toxicity uh, that we can replicate in this model. And then, uh, more importantly, we we have uh, collected a number of um, uh, data points trying to understand whether this particular model can be used for pharmacokinetic modeling. And again, that particular data is still under review uh, uh, being submitted, but the complication of the PVPK model PK modeling of uh, this particular chip, and it's a single compartment. There is really not a blood uh, compartment. There is not a filtration in this particular system. So we're only measuring reabsorption of sorts, kind of deposit or disappearance of a chemical from a perfusate. But we were able to replicate with cisplatin, gentamicin, and cadmium actually very closely the. Um, the clearance and reabsorption when we combine both the data that we collect and a PBPK model that was uh, developed for this particular instance. As you can see, cisplatin clearance to filtration rate is greater than one in vivo, and we have replicated that for gentamicin. It's about even clearance and glomerular filtration, and then cadmium is being, uh, you know, clearance is much lower than filtration, so it's being actively reabsorbed. We can establish that. And the conclusions that we drew from that particular study is that while tubular reabsorption uh, can be um, estimated with this particular model. You really need a PVPK model to uh, 
draw some conclusions about the overall clearance, but much greater confidence uh, can be gained by potential end users if you actually have a tubular secretion component as well. And that's exactly the direction that our collaborators at the University of Washington have taken. They've developed the next generation of this model where there are you know, two parallel tubes, and this is the model that we will be testing actually in um, February, and March, and April of uh, 2019. Now, another example of a perfusible system is uh, two models of the liver. Uh, these, uh, this one on the top was developed at the University of Pittsburgh by uh, Lance Taylor and Larry Vernetti, and it's a Nordis chip that uses a different part of the chip. There is a uh, chamber that is filled with cells, not only hepatocytes, but also other non parenchymal cells. And you can see an image of how this actually uh, looks in the incubator. The pump is in the incubator because the perfusion distance is pretty short. And we've tested both primary human hepatocytes from thermal and also IPS derived from Fujifilm hepatocytes. Uh, and we've uh, it takes about two days to establish this uh, platform. And then we've tested it for up to 14 days. You can sample media daily. You can also do imaging uh, daily on this platform. The uh, second one was from University of California, Berkeley, from Kevin Healy. And this is a device that is made in uh, Dr. Healy's laboratory. It's actually uh, a two-channel uh, two, uh, system. It's a one channel divided by uh, a, um, a membrane. So you seed cells, and in this particular case, only hepatocytes without non parenchymal cells into one chamber, and then you perfuse through a different chamber. And again, it's an actively perfused system. It takes about one day to test, and we again tested the cells that developers tested from a different supplier, so primary hepatocytes from Lonza, and then the same supplier, IPS-derived hepatocytes. And imaging is a big challenge with this particular model because the membrane is autofluorescent, and that really gives you a, you know, a problem with uh, seeing into the device. So just to show you a couple of data points, uh, folks usually test the functionality of hepatocytes and culture by measuring albumin and uh, urea nitrogen secretion. And you can see the dotted lines uh, with uh, thermal primary hepatocytes. These levels are low in 2D culture. And then in 3D culture, uh, both ourselves and University of Pittsburgh collaborators who had the same batch of cells, we have very similar results. And albumin levels and uh, urea nitrogen levels are very high and maintained over up to two weeks. And then with um, Berkeley device, uh, we had a different source of hepatocytes and really um, had the opposite result. Uh, there was no albumin secretion and blood urea nitrogen levels really went a way down. So here, one cannot conclude whether it's a device or the hepatocytes from that particular donor, that particular source, that were the reason why this was not a very good result. But when you have the same uh, type of cells, and in this particular case, Fujifilm Cellular Dynamics International IPS derived hepatocytes with the same NPC uh, fraction, we actually have found that we have a very similar result to the one we showed with thermal hepatocytes. And in this case, we could compare it across two different platforms. Forms. Again, the results are very, very similar. So it's not the device, it's actually the source of cells that is very important, something that we have found with the kidney device as well. But the functionality is not ending with just albumin and urea nitrogen, so metabolism is very important, and we've done a lot of experiments. One example I'm going to show you with adding tofenadine to the perfusion media and then measuring both tofenadine and formation of hexafenadine that requires metabolism by cytochrome P453A4. And uh, as you can see in 2D on the left, uh, in the first day of uh, culture, we do have hexafenadine formation, but that metabolism really uh, goes away as you keep culturing these cells. But in a 3D system, thexafenadine formation is uh, consistent as we add, uh, as we change media and add more terfenadine, we actually form thexafenadine very consistently. And then with uh, I-cell hepatocytes, uh, very similar results uh, in 2D, there's metabolism uh, over first couple of days, but then there's a very consistent metabolism over time in the 3D culture. And then with uh, Berkeley, uh, Lonza hepatocytes, uh, not surprisingly, we're not doing much in, with respect to metabolism past day one. But then when you have I-cell hepatocytes and the Berkeley device in 3D on the bottom right, you see again a formation of hexafenidine that is very consistent, albeit perhaps at the slightly lower levels um, uh, than in the University of Pittsburgh device.
So our conclusions from this particular experiment, the 2D cultures, as everyone knows, are really not suitable for metabolism studies. But then these 3D microphysiological devices from both uh, laboratories really maintain metabolic function as much as uh, they maintain the basic functionality of hepatocytes. And it's, you know, again, what we've seen before, the source of cells is very important and CDI cells are something that is reproducible from the same donor. And as we all know, hepatocytes from their primary uh, will be exhausted eventually and having a different batch or a different donor may reproduce uh, experiment to experiment variability. So let me conclude with a couple of slides here. So um, what have we learned uh, doing testing of microphysiological systems over two years? First thing that surprised me that we were actually able to do this. It sounds daunting to be able to transfer technology that is very complicated from different labs, but once you have dedicated staff and once you understand what the workflows are and once you have help from the developers, it is actually possible. And again, I'd like to appreciate both staff that we had here and also our collaborators who have gone out of their way to help us uh, establish this technology transfer. It's also very important that all of our data are in the University of Pittsburgh Microphysiological Database. In over two years, we have run about 1,500 different chips and about 5,000 uh, you know, 2D experiments. We have collected tens of thousands of data points and hundreds of images. And all of this information will be available one year after we have concluded depositing the data into the University of Pittsburgh Microphysiological Systems Database. So I invite all of you to access that site and, uh, and start visiting that regularly because the data data will be released. Uh, our kidney data, for example, is, uh, is now in public domain. Now, detailed descriptions of all the phenotypic endpoints and equipment that's necessary and very detailed protocols. This is also something that we'll be adding to the University of Pittsburgh Microphysiological Systems database. This is very important for the potential use of this technology by end users because it's not enough to just have a publication and then materials and methods section or even a protocol from a developer lab from people who actually do this every day. So the detailed protocols that we develop would be potentially very, very useful. There are you know, very typical challenges. Every platform is different and we uh, do not stop to be surprised how different these technologies are and you have to have a very open mind working with any of them. But uh, what we found is not all developers are open to sharing their technology and that's okay. I mean, not everyone is willing to you know, give their devices to someone else to try and test. Uh, some of the devices and their quality, you know, have to make them. There's a lot of material science and there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, lithography and printing that it goes into that and the rigorous quality controlling of devices themselves is very, very important. Likewise, uh, quality of cells that are used in microphysiological systems and devices is equally important. Sometimes these cells are not available, especially if, uh, uh, if the platforms were developed with primary cells. And then there are, you know, different devices have different levels of technical complexity and you have to be prepared to deal with that. But there are also a lot of opportunities. Uh, we are continuing this work for the next two years. We have six of our existing partners and five new partners who have agreed to continue working with us. And we have 19 microphysiological systems that we aim to test in the next two years from 2018 to 2020. Uh, we do see that developers are generally interested in, in the feedback that we provide. And then a number of stakeholders, both folks in the pharma and the chemical industry are generally interested in, in our experiences. And we are doing a lot of visits to talk to them about what we have found and how this technology can really be ported. But I really am uh, or feeling that I'm a representative or potential customer. So I do have a number of thoughts as well to share with you. I do believe that this technology is extremely useful and very promising and that by engineering research and development needs further support. However, the applications of these tissue chips will be highly fit for purpose. And I do not believe that in the short term the next three to five years, these tissue chips will really replace animals or even in vitro studies. I you know, hope that some of these devices will be ready, but in reality, we're in the short term, we're not replacing animal testing. And for all of you listening, I think you have to you know, really um, you know, believe in this technology to start replacing data that you're used to from standard in vitro studies or from animal studies. But the developers also need to appreciate the, uh, the need for 
portability and ease of use and uh, reasonable cost of these devices. These are not easy to work with. These are not less expensive than traditional in vitro studies or even animal studies. And so where that balance is between the throughput and the cost of this complicated technology, you know, I'm not sure uh, we have a very good comfortable understanding of that yet. And uh, when people think that really it's the bridge between the developers and then the regulatory agencies, I think that first bridge is between the developers and then the users who will develop data, who will then go to the regulatory agencies. But the end users, companies, uh, a lot of you are listening, you really need to be ready to be thinking about these technologies and they need to have the workforce that is ready to start working with this. You know, toxicologists or biologists may or may not be immediately comfortable using this technology. So thinking of who to hire and how to train staff is also very important. But then the regulatory agencies, the decision makers, both internally and externally to companies, also need to be educated about what the state of art is and what it can and cannot do right now. And the work of our center and our centers like ours is very important in this regard. But finally, what type of validation really we need to think about in terms of tissue chips? Validation is a very standard um, and very well defined process for in vitro methods that replace animal tests. But tissue chips are far more complicated and it's a technology that's still being very actively developed. And the real validation, the one that exists in Europe, where there is a network of uh, testing laboratories and where there is a ring trial me methodology, this is really not that is ready, in my opinion, right now for this very uh, complicated technology and, again, technology that is still in early stages of development. Organic validation, you know, this is kind of what our center has been doing, uh, you know, sometimes felt like, um, you know, very complicated thing because these devices are, um, are engineering devices and there are lots of connections, there are lots of um, uh, tricks that you need to learn and you really need to be ready for this. But Finally, what I think really is going to take hold, and this is something where we're working with next, is the fit for purpose validation. The industry that our users need to define how the, you know, what questions they think are ready for tissue chips, and then that information has to be embraced by developers to be able to develop technology that fits that particular question, rather than developing a technology that replaces a particular animal or an organ system. So I really appreciate your time uh, listening to this. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rusin, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank Labroots for making today's educational webcast possible. Now, before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2019. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.